see Helen. It's great to see Helen and Les here this evening. And Helen, you're going to start off. So I'll hand over to you now, if I may. Okay, thank you so much, Harvey, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to, to all at LAMAS um, for, for inviting Les and I along this evening, um, especially to Catherine Stubbs, who initially got in contact to ask us if he wanted to come and give this lecture. Um, so a little bit of background on, on Les and I. Um, Les is a project manager at AOC Archaeology, um, and I formerly worked at AOC as well as a project officer, um, and I'm now at MOLA. But um, of course, um, our work sort of lives on um, after we change jobs. And this is a piece of work that, um, that me and Les worked on fairly recently. Um, and so we're really happy to be here this evening to tell you all about that. So, so an introduction to the talk, first of all. Um, today, we're going to talk about a site um, over in Havering, as Harvey explained, um, the site of Royal Liberty School, um, investigated by AOC during 2019. Um, and when we did that work, we were commissioned by RPS on behalf of Wilmot Dixon Construction. Okay, I think we're having a technical hitch here. Helen did indicate she was having internet connections and she said that if she lost connection, she would hop out and come back in as soon as possible. Um, so I think we'll have a, a brief moment of talking amongst ourselves uh, and see if Helen can come back in. If she doesn't, Les, I'm afraid we're gonna throw it to you to uh, give the introduction to the site. Right, I think Helen's coming back in. Hi, I'm I'm so sorry, it keep me out again. I'm gonna share the screen. Could you tell me where I got to you in that? Uh, very much in the introduction. So I think you could you could certainly say- It wasn't very, it, it yeah. wasn't very long at all, Helen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry. I don't know Not what's going on. Don't know what's going on with the internet, but um, let me just share. Okay, so we're back in the introduction. So I'll just I'll just kind of start over again. So so firstly, I was saying thank you to all at Lamas um, for inviting us along. I won't say that again, but we are very grateful. Um, and then I was just going on to introduce the content of the talk. So um, today, Les and I are going to talk about a site in Havering, as as Harvey was explaining. Um, the site of Royal Liberty School, investigated um, by AOC um, during 2019, uh, commissioned by RPS on behalf of Wilmot Dixon Construction Limited. So we're gonna tell you about some of the key findings from this site. Uh, firstly, evidence for Roman occupation, um, then the archeological traces of the site's use as a training facility during the First World War, um, and then the results of a program of historic building recording um, carried out on a series of Second World War structures. So I'll be telling you about the results of excavation at the site. Um, I've been involved in the publication of these results in London Archaeologist magazine. And Les will then be telling us about the results of the historic building recording programme, which he carried out. So we have lots of people to thank um, for, for all their contributions to this, this project. Um, so I've put them up on the screen here. Um, thank you to um, our clients, um, project management, fieldwork, um, archaeological specialists, and I'll be putting this screen up again um, right at the end of the talk as well, so you can read these names again if you want to. So the site itself, um, it's located um, in Havering, East London, um, close to, uh, close to Gidea Park, Gidea Park Station. Um, and it occupies um, an almost flat, um, irregularly shaped piece of land. And um, it's, it's important to add, I think it's gonna become important for Les's part of the talk later, that um, this whole area is, is fairly flat and, and quite open. So um, hopefully that gives you a flavor of, of the site itself. 
The site is home to Hare Hall, um, a beautiful Palladian mansion designed by the architect James Payne and built for um, John A. Wallinger, who was a, a worthy, uh, wealthy merchant who traded in Portland stone. And this was built in, um, in the years 1769 to 70. You can see that in this, this lovely engraving just here. So after having been used as a training ground for um, the second battalion of the Artist Rifles Regiment during the First World War, and I'll be coming back to that later, the building was extended in 1920 to make room for the Royal Liberty School, which is housed since 1921. So today the, the Royal Liberty School is a boys secondary school. I actually visited the school back in the autumn of 2019 to deliver an assembly on what AOC uh, what the AOC field team found um, on site and had an absolutely brilliant time um, talking to the students who were really excited actually about the school's archaeology, which is great. Um, the playing ground in the, uh, the, the playing field in the foreground of this image is the area where AOC's exhibitions took place um, ahead of the construction of a new sports hall and a new teaching block as well. And you can see um, in the aerial photo here, um, the extensions made to the original Hare Hall um, in 1920 before the school arrived here. So um, three wings were added um, to form that central quadrangle you can see with, with cloisters around the inner edges. And along the right hand side of this image, um, you can just spot, um, hopefully, and Les will talk more about these later, but some of the, the Second World War structures that, um, that Les carried out the historic building recording on. So during May 2019, an archaeological evaluation was carried out um, on the site, followed by an excavation, watching brief and the historic building recording during August of 2019. And the excavations targeted um, the two areas that covered the footprints of those two new school buildings, um, which you can see there, Trench 8 and Trench 9. And then the archaeological watching brief targeted the intrusive groundworks associated with the excavation of new service trenches. And you can see those there in the light blue color as well, as well as the, as well as the buildings, um, three buildings there in dark blue. So a summary of our findings um, during these excavations. The, the site was situated on London Clay Formation and the natural deposits encountered um, comprised a series of alluvial clays, um, sa uh, silts and sands with gravel, varying in color from um, sort of dark brownish red to grays and blues, and laying at between um, sort of, well, very, very, it's very flat. You'll Jane, I think we're lost again. Yeah, I think Helen um, is clearly struggling awfully with the internet connection tonight. We'll just give her a moment and then possibly Les will ask you to, to yeah. pick up. Um, Les, you have the presentation on your computer at the moment, don't you? I do. I can I can put it up and Helen can talk over it. Is that is that is that a possibility? I think that might be better. If you can do that. Mm. Yeah, so Leslie, if you can put, um, if you can share your screen on the same slide, and then when Helen comes back, because yes, it may be that her bandwidth is struggling with sharing yeah. her screen. Right. Hello, Helen, don't panic. <laughs> Les is going to put his screen up. So we think that it may work better if Les is driving the PowerPoint for you, so you're using less bandwidth. Um, and yes, well, that's a great idea. Thanks, Les. And, and Les will change the slides when you're ready to ask him to do so. I think that would be good. If that's okay. Okie dokie. Okay. So um, I was watching. Uh, I was watching you guys in the the images there to see if 
see when you kind of stopped moving. Um, and, <laughs> but I'm presuming that I got up to some time in this in the slide of investigation. So yeah. um, shall yeah. I pick up from here? Please, yes, do. Okay. Yes. Don't so, don't worry about it. It'll it'll go fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, just say, Someone, oh, Chris Constable says I was describing the geology, so thank you. Um, so Helen, Liz, can you, you see? Can you see that all right? Is that on how it's supposed to look? No, it's not on slide view, Les. If you can um, go up to slideshow on the top bar, go to your, go along the right, get Jill to drive. <laughs> okay, you want that. I, I actually think this is already on the slideshow show, and I had this problem um, the other day with mine as well on a different computer so we can't blame that for it. So I don't really understand this nowadays how this is working. I, I think it's it's the icon on along the top menu bar that's like oh, oh, thank you. That's fine. Right. Whatever that was that worked. Lovely. Thank cool. you. So, um, so Chris, uh, Chris Constable, let me know that, that I think we've moved on just to the next slide, Les. So if you could move that one. Thank you. So, so a summary of the the findings of the excavations on site. Um, the the site was situated on on London clay formation, um, and the natural deposits encountered comprised a series of uh, alluvial clays, silts, and sands with gravel, um, varying in colour from uh, dark brownish reds to greys and blues and laying at between 33.2 and 33.5 meters OD. So very, very flat site again. Um, and the excavations um, identified a number of, of post-med uh, features and finds um, probably relating to the parklands and gardens of Hare Hall. Um, these are shown in blue on the plan there. And we're not actually gonna talk um, much more about these today purely because we've got so many other interesting things to talk about. Um, we also uncovered a, a zigzag um, shaped practice trench dug during the First World War, which hopefully you can see clearly there in green. And I'll come back to this later. Um, but for now, I'm going to be talking about the, the Roman features on the site, which is shown there in red. So Les, would you move the slide along, please? Thank you. So. Um, so the excavations revealed um, a series of, of Roman ditches and a pit, which cut into the natural deposits. Um, these kind of these were a series of narrow ditches in, in trench eight, which was the sort of southern trench there, um, probably representing um, minor agricultural divisions. Uh, whilst a larger ditch in trench nine, just to the north, um, may represent a slightly more established or slightly more substantial boundary. Next slide, please. Ah, thanks. You even know when to do it. Um, so the, the Roman features were dated through um, a moderately sized assemblage of Roman pottery, most of which dated broadly to 200 to 400 AD. And this was assessed by um, Anna Doherty of ASC. So thank you, Anna. Um, and because of the site's location, Anna used uh, London fabric and form codes, but also kind of recorded the assemblage with um, the regional type series used in Essex as well. The assemblage was, um, was typical of a fairly low status rural site in this region. It was made up largely of unsourced uh, coursewares, but some examples of typical later Roman uh, sort of regionally traded fine wares were also noted, including Neen Valley color-coated wares and Haddenham and Ox uh, Oxfordshire red wares. Sheds from a single abraded Samian ware vessel, which you can see on the screen there as well, um, were also noted. Anna wrote that the, the source of this was slightly ambiguous, but that it may be of East Gaulish, um, possibly um, Trier origin. A single residual shed from an earlier Roman vessel was also noted, a fragment from an early lid seated Bedrim jar associated with a first century AD uh, Shelley ware. But that was the only um, sort of only early, early Roman evidence found on the site. Some Roman uh, CBM was also present. Fragments of brick, tegula and other tile were assessed by uh, Ray Regensberg, of, also of ASC, so thank you Ray. A single piece of flue tile with comb keying was present. Um, this will have formed part of a hypercore system. And while 
Most of the Roman tile was undiagnostic in terms of form. A large proportion of it um, bore evidence of post-firing heat exposure. And Ray suggested that although these tiles didn't show any evidence of keying, the heat exposure may suggest that they also originated from hypercore systems, so quite interesting. So the, the Roman evidence from the site um, perhaps wasn't too sort of groundbreaking in itself, um, especially when we compare it to the really spectacular sites um, that we know from the city of London, for example. However, I think it, it could be quite interesting when we place it into its local context. The Roman evidence from the site um, implies the presence of um, um, potential settlement in the vicinity during the later Roman period between AD 200 and 400, with ceramic building materials suggesting that Roman masonry buildings may have been present somewhere nearby. The, the Ro uh, Rural Settlement of Roman, da uh, Roman Britain database has recorded comparatively few um, sort of masonry buildings in Les, I think it may be time for you to um, to drive for a little bit. OK, as, as Helen was saying there, the Rural Settlement of Roman Britain database recorded comparatively few masonry buildings in this area of East London and South Essex. There just don't seem to be many later Roman villas in the area compared to the opposite side of the Thames down through Kent and North Surrey. So perhaps the suggestion of masonry buildings near here is significant and it raises questions of where that material came from. It's pretty close to the uh, course of the Roman road from London to Colchester, roughly the course of the A12, although definitive evidence for that road has yet to be found. Here's a map of the road from London to Harwich from 1766, the site marked with a red arrow there. I mean, it's a long history, really. It goes all the way to Great Yarmouth, but it's so historic and interesting Helen notes that she grew up on the side of it, so she's obviously a local girl to the site. The approximate location of the site shown by that red arrow, can you see hair? That, that, that marks um, hair hall on the map. This map shows other Roman evidences, evidences in the vicinity, and there's cremations at uh, points D, E and F in small red letters there. So around the site, we're, we're right in the middle there, and there's quite a few of these were antiquarian and 19th century finds. If we look at more recently excavated, like later Roman features in the area, there's a Roman boundary ditch at Hornchurch bus garage over there at B on the south of the picture, and second and third century pits at Mark's Warren Quarry there in the west. Southeast, towards Havering, a Moorhall Farm and Hunts Hill Farm, both sites published by Mola, and both of which have later Roman agricultural features as part of longer lived sites. But it does seem possible that Romford could be the site of the Roman settlement Durolitum, which is named in the Antonine itinerary. Another possible location has been suggested as Little London in Chigwell. Mm -hmm. Um, which is on the route of the London to Great Dunmo Road. But uh, Nick Fuentes, in a 1986 paper, favoured Romford as the location for that Roman settlement. Really, that's based on the topography and local Roman find spots. We do, it does seem that small nucleated settlements in Londinium's hinterland tend to be located along the main roads out of the city in a ring about 20 kilometres distant. Royal Liberty School sits just beyond that range, 21 kilometres, or that's about um, 15 miles in old money, but Romford is within it, and any settlement close to the school would have been relatively nearby, and certainly a possible source for any of that Roman building material. So to conclude, the Roman evidence we've got at Royal Liberty School suggests that we're on the periphery of a Roman settlement, a settlement with Roman buildings, some with hypercosts, close to the route of the road, and one potential site of Durolitum. These masonry buildings would be quite rare in this part of London, and perhaps something for uh, Glass to keep an eye out for any planning applications in the area.
there'll be some of you watching who know much more about the hinterland of Roman London than I do, so do let us know at the end of the talk. We'll move on now into the First World War, spanning 1500 years in a single slide. You see in the top of that picture on the right we have a zigzag trench, that's um, a First World War practice trench. We excavated a couple of slots through it and it's remarkably a void of any finds at all. Absolutely nothing in these trenches. The um, zigzag shape is re reflective of First World War trenches, um, shaped to prevent those within from shrapnel and other flying debris, blast damage. It's all very well being down a trench, which will keep you safe when a bomb goes off on the surface, but not if it lands in there. So there's a, a cross section through the trench on the left of the picture. The trenches also appear as scorch marks in, in the hot summer across the site. You, I mean, to start with, you can see the post medieval ditch running through the site and not highlighted, but in the lighter areas of ground, you can actually see the entire zigzag of three rows of trenches following the parkland on the north side of the school. Now, Helen mentioned earlier that Hare Hall was the site of a World War I training facility used by the 2nd Battalion of the Artists Rifles Regiment, a regiment made up of painters, writers, musicians, playwrights, sculptors and other artists. Makes you, well, it makes me wonder how actually good they'd, they'd be as a fighting unit. But some of these men are well known for creating evocative and often disturbing, harrowing representations of their experiences on the battlefield. For example, the brothers Paul Nash and John Nash were part of the regiment, and this is the Men in Road by Paul Nash of 19, uh, painted in 1919. Just look at that one for a while. I think that's a really good picture, actually. Almost magic realism. One of uh, Britain's most famous First World War poets, Wilfred Owen, was also part of the regiment, tragically killed just one week before the armistice. And here's an extract from one of his best known poems, Dulce et Decorum Est. You probably all know it's the Latin title taken from Horace, who wrote a slightly longer phrase which translates as, It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. But I don't see any reason why I shouldn't read it out for those who might be hard of seeing. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we curse through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshot, all went lame, all blind, drunk of fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. And uh, here's a picture of the artist's rifles cadets digging a trench in 1916. Um, R.C. Sheriff, the writer, is standing second from left. And thanks to Kingston Grammar School and Surrey History for this. So it's not, this isn't our site, but it's a good example of what the artist rifles cadets would have been doing. And as you see, excavating a practice trench. That's, um, that's actually Gidea Hall, just to the north of Hare Hall, demolished in 1930s. And that was uh, an officer school for the Artists' Rifles Brigade. I expect some of these other characters standing there are known artists from the time. We just only know of R.C. Sheriff strutting a rather, a rather grand pose there on the left. Um, here we go on to Gidea Hall. So that's the site of the other place where um, our artists were just posing in front engraving there by Harvey Repton. There's a lot of names associated with this site. Uh, this photo from RF Essex shows a practice trench at Balgore's Lane, which is also close to Hare Hall, looking southwest from Romford. And the trench that we excavated and the slots that we excavated into the archaeological remains of the practice trench didn't give us any information, but you see here various parts of shoring and piling and defences and a bank on both sides and uh, men actually standing around not doing a lot in this photo. You can see in the background the railway embankment and RAF Romford and brewery chimney and St Edward's Church spire there 
on the right. This is um, a memorial to the members of the artist rifle who lost their lives during the First and Second World War. That's at the Royal Academy of Arts London. It doesn't name them all. So that was the end of the part that Helen was going to do. So now I shall take over as myself. And we're just repeating this slide from earlier because it's the introduction to the historic building record. But the three buildings we looked at marked here is A, B and C. I could have numbered them one, two, three. It makes no difference. You've got to have identifiers. And you may notice there they're close to the site boundary. The site boundary there is actually lined with a lot of mature trees, which would have equally been, well, not quite so mature, but mature certainly in the 1940s when these were built. They are two bomb shelters and one reinforced, um, possibly, gunner's post. I'll come on to what I think they might be as we look at the pictures. And they're looking out over the, what are now playing fields. All the site is developed around with housing since the earliest, early 20th century. But it, it would have been looking out over a very broad expanse, um, which of course would have, would have had potential really for um, enemy landings, as, as well as um, the defence of London. This is um, what we call Building A, one of two virtually identical buildings made of um, brick. The walls are only about a foot thick. The roof is precast concrete. You can see uh, in, the, in the roof the impressions of pine boarding, which was the shape that it was cast on. The two wooden signposts there no longer had any naming on, but it may have had um, an identifier. These are, I think, civilian shelters, possibly for staff or children at the school, and could have easily housed, housed about 30 people. The door there open on the left is an original door. It leads through into a short passage with a sharp right turn, and that's a blast screen there before the passage goes right. I suppose it helps shelter people if there's a blast in the doorway. The large windows there with um, the, the wooden shutters, those are later additions to the building. I don't think this would have had windows. You can't really protect yourself from blast damage with windows that are nearly four foot wide and two foot tall. On the right of the building, you can't see in this picture, there's a, a little brick extension would have, which would have housed the chimney for a small fireplace or stove. Um, the bricks made by the London Brick Company, who started manufacturing, I think, in the 1930s. For any of those who are brick maniacs out there, do go to the Penmore for website for all your brick manufacturing needs. The view of the inside, looking back at the doorway, there where we've got the original um, switches and light fittings and fuse boxes from when it was established in the 1940s. You've got a little area on the right which could have been curtained off and I assume that's where there'd have been a bucket for facilities for people who were staying in the shelter overnight. This building was recently used as just stores for gardeners of the grounds of the school which explains I think that table and a lot of the litter that um, litters the floor. There's a little close-up of the um, switches and electricity supply on the right. I'm looking back in the uh, the other direction towards the little stove and fireplace here in the picture on the top left. I'm imagining this green paint could be the original paint to the walls. We've got a little um, iron uh, support on the ceiling that I think would have held a water tank. So this bomb shelter would have been, or blast shelter, would have been fitted out with fresh water and a fireplace and what toilet facilities you could manage in a bucket in, in the corner on the way in. And there's a view of the inside of the windows on the right. They're clearly inserted. There's a strip of concrete all the, all the way around. The second bomb shelter, um, this is it. They're exactly the same construction. Same sort of bricks, same sort of windows added later with a concrete surround. 
same sort of roof, same sort of inside. On the right, top right there, there's the, um, the place for the stove that's been bricked up. The external parts have been knocked down. There on the bottom right, again, is the blast screen and the doorway on the left of the central column and a little area that, that could be curtained off on the right. On the left is something I really can't explain. It's not a penguin, but it's some kind of bird motif. Whether it's it's a motif from the school, it looks a bit like a hawk or, or from a regiment or something that was just done to pass the time. It's a most peculiar thing, but it does look a lot like a, it looks to me a lot like a bird. It's, let's call it a perching bird. Um, between the two buildings, there's just uh, an area for lawn mowers. We move moving swiftly on, but not too swiftly, to our third building. This is a, a square, entirely cast building. You can see the strips on the external walls of both pictures there, which is where the wooden shuttering um, has left its, its mark on the concrete. These are built with reinforced metal bars with some spalling in places. So that's entirely original. There's a vent on the top right. The roof is a separate piece which have been added and a little kind of louver vent over the door. So it's not stopping gas getting in, but it's going to be able to stop shrapnel. On the picture on the right, the school has uh, had covered over the window. This is obviously to stop naughty children going in. But that was the only other external opening. It doesn't seem to have been a machine gun post. Maybe it's more of an observer post, keeping keeping an eye on the on anything that might be either flying over on a bombing raid towards London or or even uh, parachutists coming in. We have recorded Royal Observer Corps buildings in the past at AOC, and it's. It's about the right time to do it now before all the members of the ROC fall off their perches through old age. But if you can speak to these people from the war, there will be people who will remember what, what was going on here. We haven't managed to track down anyone who remembers what was going on in these buildings. But of course, if they were for staff or children in the war, really, we're looking at people who are in their 80s and are over. Now, internally, we can have a look at the inside of the building. There's just nothing, nothing really. And the picture on the top right, there's, I think, a, um, a scar left from a wooden bench, if you like, below the window, maybe for kneeling on, if you're looking out the window, or for sitting on when resting. And the only other thing in the room, apart from a modern carpet on the floor, is um, the electricity supply. So, OK, they had lighting in the past. It's not really telling us much. I'd have liked to have got out onto the roof, but health and safety said no, because I do wonder whether or not our building, sorry, I'll go back to the external, whether our building might have had something attached to the roof, possibly an anti-aircraft gun or a signalling mechanism so it could join into the whole ROC uh, connected information network which could signal about enemy bombers or landings. So to conclude about our buildings, I would, uh, they, really we've noticed there, there are two types. There are the rectangular brick blocks with concrete roof and blast screen entries. They'd have offered some blast protection but would not have survived a direct hit. They've been modified over the years with the addition of those windows and the removal of the um, fireplace slash stove facility in one. But the straps for the water tank and the show us just a level of self-sufficiency in once you were inside. The rapid construction of civilian shelters was a response to bombing raids on civilian targets. These aren't below ground things. I don't think they'd have really ever had... Um, earthen banks over them. All that brick was, work was pointed up properly as if it was meant to be seen or at least neat, not something you'd bury underground. So they seem to be a form of surface shelter. They're often these shelters, they're simply long brick and concrete structures built on pavements or beside buildings. And these, all these buildings have now been 
uh, demolished as part of the development of the school and these buildings are of course getting fewer and fewer. Um, the reason for that one entrance really is to limit blast damage through openings, that's why inserting the windows in them is such a mistake really. These are not particularly blast proof, many models were badly constructed using substandard mortar and to be honest, I don't want to be rude about the London Brick Company, but using substandard bricks as well. Shelters like this would have been fitted with rows of bunks and toilet facilities in the cavity beside the entrance. I've looked at some of uh, newspaper articles from the 40s and it seems that the performance from some of the earlier street shelters were not good for public morale. The walls are shaken down either by earth shock or direct blast and then the concrete roofs would tend to fall down on whoever was inside. They're not particularly blast proof as I've said already. The size of these shelters, the government, the, uh, the Civil Defence Act of 1939 from the government said that a shelter should be limited to no more than 50 persons. That obviously a response to um, catastrophic bombing events. So the size of these ones became pretty common for surface and semi-sunken air raid shelters in schools, businesses and public areas. Just move on to building C again. The robust quality of building C, far more robust than the uh, than the cast with its cast concrete than those other shelters, does suggest that it's more of a military outpost, perhaps maybe a fortified lookout post. But I've looked for evidence from the ROC for communication equipment and communication networks. Perhaps it's just a simple home guard use, one or two chaps in there with a gun looking out for um, um, attackers, glider landings and um, parachutists. I would say that the presence of this block against these, it is quite hidden in the school boundary. If you do get a chance to go around Essex, there's so many little bunkers hidden in the countryside, in sheds, in barns, in hedgerows. Uh, where's one I'm thinking of? Tilty Mill. I don't know if you know Tilty Mill. Worth a visit. Medieval site with a mill on it, but it's got a little um, pillbox just hidden inside a barn. You cannot see it until you're right up against it. Um, the concept of the shelter was detailed in the Southern Command Memo dated the 22nd of June 1940, which, conserver, which uh, covers the construction of general headquarters zones, which stated the immediate object is to divide England into several small fields surrounded by a hedge of anti-tank obstacles, which is strong defensively using natural accidents of the ground where possible. So we're looking at one on the edge of this very flat ground, which the school uses as their playing fields. So it's not this, this is not a classic pillbox design and it doesn't fit into the regular stop line so let's go for a fortified observation post on the area of the open land in the event of airborne assault. So I'm going to finally conclude moving on to our last um, I'm going to say a couple of slides, so just to reinforce. I don't know if Helen, you want to come back in? Hello. So if I can manage to stay in long enough without getting kicked out again. Um, thank you, Les, so much for taking over there. I'm really glad I sent you my uh, my notes across <laughs> before this. Um, so, yeah, to conclude, um, so um, a really interesting range of evidence um, of different periods from this site. Um, firstly, evidence for um, a possible Roman settlement in the area, um, potentially with masonry buildings, some with hypercausts, um, close to the Roman road and close to the, um, the, the possible site of the settlement of Duralitum. So um, as Les was saying earlier, something, something interesting to look out for in the area there. Um, Secondly, archaeological traces of, um, of the use of Hare Hall as uh, the training camp for the artist's rifles. Um, it's wonderful to be able to find um, archaeological evidence of something that you can um, almost see in photos. Um, we didn't manage to find any photos of um, the exact practice trench 
um, that we uh, excavated archaeologically, but um, the photos that Les was speaking about earlier show practice trenches um, very close by Gidea Hall. So we get a really good idea of exactly what those looked like um, when they were in use. Um, and of course, it's, 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 it's wonderful to be able to connect those two um, to the people that we know were using them. Um, members of the artist rifles who've, who've left, left us their um, amazing and um, informative and evocative work after the First World War. And, and thirdly, the evidence that Les has just, just described, evidence for, for life at the school during the Second World War um, with uh, civi civilian shelters, protecting um, perhaps the students and staff, staff of the school from air raids, perhaps local community as well. Um, and I think really interestingly, as, as Les was talking about just now, um, possible evidence for um, a sort of a more defensive shelter, maybe relating to the, the open parkland on which the school's situated. So that's it from us. Um, and thank you again um, to all of you for listening and bearing with um, my technical issues. So apologies for those again. Um, thank you to Lamas for having us um, and to everyone who's been involved in this project so far. Thank you very much. Thanks then to both Helen and Les. Everyone at home, I'm sure, is, is clapping away. I thought that was really enjoyable. I have to admit to my complete ignorance about the artist's rifles, um, which, is, which is fascinating. Um, if I can ask for people to pop any questions they have in, we have one question and one comment. The comment's really interesting. So I will read that. It's from Joseph Nicholas. Um, a possibly irrelevant comment about John Nash, whose painting The Men in Road was shown earlier in the talk. Although he enlisted in the rifles on the outbreak of war, he wasn't posted to the front until March 1917 and then returned two months later because he'd fallen into a trench and broken his arm. Just as well, his regiment went over the top a few weeks later and suffered huge casualties. Had Nash been in that attack, we'd probably have lost a noticed British surrealist artist. So thank you very much for that. Um, as I say, I wasn't aware of, of the um, battalion. And so this has been really interesting. And that's that's a great anecdote. So thank you, Joseph. OK, we, we have a question, question for Les from Isabel Thompson. Might Building C have been used by a school cadet troop? Anything is possible. With no fixtures or fittings on the inside, it could easily have been used as a, for a cadet troop, but we're only that it's only about six foot square. It would have to be a very, very small cadet troop. Really, I was thinking more two home guard or perhaps um, an observer with a transmitter on the roof. And of course, that, leave, that would leave no evidence apart from a couple of bolts once the transmitter had, the transmitter had come down and we didn't get to see that. Perhaps there are others like it. Um, I've looked, is it Wayne Cocroft has done, done a book on defences, but he hasn't got anything like that. Perhaps someone at Swindon knows. Good Lord, if, if Wayne doesn't know what it is, then, <laughs> then frankly, we're doomed. But it's even more important then that it's um, it's been recorded. Yes, yeah, so there's not a lot of them left. It is quite a worry how quickly these things are going. Um, and it, it does rather underline the importance of at least recording them before they go. Uh, I should explain that Wayne Cocroft is one of the leading British experts on military architecture. And if he's not seen something like this, that means it's very, very rare. Do we have any more questions for Helen and Les? I can come in, Jane, if you have them. I've got a few. I would be very happy to ask for a few comments yeah. I'd like to put to both Les and Helen. Yes, please, Harvey. OK, well, but going through it chronologically, just to mention the Roman station, I thought that would, I mean, both, both Helen and, and Les, in talking about that, uh, introduced, I thought, a very, very important point. Um, the, uh, they referred to the Relitum, they referred to the Antonine itinerary, the Antonino Trinity, many of you will know, is, appears to be an official list of route stations um, through Britain and indeed through other parts of the empire. 
And the places like Jurelyton, whether or not that is at Romford, will be places where there would be an official station on the road, providing not only facilities for visitors, but also uh, centres for administration uh, and places where escorts might be changed over. And I think, um, I think Liz, Les did make a point and I've reinforced it. We are clearly close to a very major Roman road. Um, the way that Romford appears on that road, and a change in the alignment of the major route, uh, a river running through it and south towards the Thames, suggests that's a, a very appropriate place for a, a Mancio or a Mutatione, a, a minor or a major station to be. And I think finding uh, this evidence would clearly contain residue from, uh, from, from stone buildings, uh, I think it indicates that the importance of making sure that all, all work that's going to be done, all development projects, whether, whether, whether they are um, redevelopment or, or whether they are actually the removal of mineral deposits, uh, work ought to be done to find evidence if it is there, uh, as this case is done. And I, I hope that does mean that other sites in the area will be flagged for investigation uh, once development or, or other proposals come out from them. So it's a very important site and it's, it, that's great. Um, moving on, Jane, you stopped me when you got another question. But moving on to the, the, the First World War um, and the, the, the artist rifles, I mean, what, a, what almost a huge tragedy um, that was. I suppose at the time, attracting people to enlist meant that you might form local regiments or regiments of particular activities. But um, uh, putting uh, all those potential artists, and actual artists uh, in single regiments, then exporting them to, uh, to, the, to the front uh, on the continent was, uh, uh, I mean, clearly meant that, that many, many of these people died uh, during the war. And I don't think, if my memory is right, I don't think that similar mistakes were made in the, it's almost a private, you know, saving private Ryan's moment. But I don't think those mistakes were made in the Second World War. People were more or less dispersed and not, not, uh, not, not put into those particular regiments by, by trade. And then my third point would relate to the, the actual evidence for the Second World War activities. Uh, we are, of course, um, I, I mean, and I think again the point's made, we're on an invasion course there. Um, so in the earlier part of the war, when German invasions were, were a possibility, clearly military sites were likely to be on those sites east of London, whether you're north or south of the river. Uh, and also you're on the, the, the major routes for the V1s and the V2s later in the war. Um, and uh, so again, you'd be um, certainly south of the river, there were uh, batteries of guns where it might be possible to bring down one or two, certainly of the V1s, if, if not the V2s. But all that work is terribly important. Les referred to uh, those who might survive, and a, a quick calculation, Les, to me, suggests that anyone who might have served throughout the war in one of those regiments would be over 100 now, if he survived or if she survived, and therefore the time has run very short um, to retain any... Uh, records uh, and remembrances of, of those who served even in the Second War. Jane, the only other thing I would add is I thought it was a very interesting work. I'm sorry, Helen, that you had those technical problems, but both you and Les did very well. Um, thanks for um, having the, the slides ready for at least use by Les. Um, and as I say, it's a very interesting lecture. I've got two points I must make at the end, Jane. The first is to, well, three really. I mean, obviously to, to thank Helen and Les for the work they've done and for bringing it to us tonight. Secondly, uh, to any in the audience who are not members of LAMUS to make my usual plea to consider joining us, make use of our website if you'd like to, but our membership is our strength. So those who do come and, and want to enjoy and join in the activities of LAMUS, please, please do join our ranks. It'd be wonderful if you did. And thirdly, I'd just like for 
everybody's benefit. I'd just like to mention a course which is coming up at the City Lit via Zoom in January, uh, which is going to be on the archaeology of London. And uh, basically it's undertaken by Gillian Humberstone. She's done it there before. It's a 10 week course on the archaeology of London based at the City Lit, though of course uh, the contact will be virtual rather than real because of the situation that we're in. Um, and Jill suggests that uh, if you Google the archaeology of London uh, at the City Lit, you, you could find details of the course. So those, those of you who feel you'd like a 10 week introduction to London's archaeology, uh, that's something else for you. So Jane, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, all I would like to add is to note that this is our last lecture of the year, but of course we will be uh, um, carrying on in January. We will probably be carrying on via Zoom. Um, things are getting increasingly uncertain and being at home by ourselves with our computers, while we miss seeing everyone in person at the museum, this is the safest way for now. So I think we'll be carrying on in this format until things improve slightly. So please do join us in January. Uh, we'll be sending out the usual messages. Um, and otherwise, I think it's again, finally, thanks to Helen and Les. And thanks very much, Helen, for wrestling with the evil internet. And the only other thing to do is to wish everyone a happy, merry and safe Christmas. See you in the new year. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.